Well, hello, Drinker Valley family. Welcome to Bible Study, week number 38. Glad you're able to join us again on this beautiful Wednesday, rainy afternoon. I think I've said that about every Wednesday since I've been doing that. <laughs> Had a lot of rain on Wednesdays. That's all right. We'll, we'll be thankful for it later, later on this summer, I'm sure. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I've talked to several of you, you, you know, over Facebook and and through email and some text and, and different things and I certainly certainly appreciate all your you know all your compliments as far as the teaching goes we were trying to work on the sound um, uh, you know I think it may have had to do with my phone I have an older iPhone and we have an external microphone that we use to to get better pickup and I think that, that my phone may have been the issue on that. Everything I, I found online pointed to that. So that's why we're using Randall's. He's got a new iPhone. And everything I found from Apple said that the new iPhone worked great with an external mic. So hopefully you'll be able to, to hear it clearly. Uh, I know YouTube does pretty good on, on their volume. Citizens Cable, uh, the volume's not, not too good on their broadcast channel. We, we upload it to them as well. And they show it on Saturdays at uh, 5 o'clock. So you need to kill, need to kill that on my phone. Randall, Randall shares it on my phone, and sometimes you can hear it talking on there. And he, he doesn't hear that, so I have to I have to let him know that. But that's okay. <laughs> that's all right. He's still a good producer and cameraman, and he does a whole nine yards. But anyway, prayerfully, prayerfully, by the will of God, we'll be we'll be back in the sanctuary next Wednesday night. Uh, I sent out a phone message to all you Draper Valley guys, telling you that because because some of you I think. Uh, thought that maybe we were going to start tonight, but it's actually next week. We are, we're going to do Sunday school, Sunday morning. Uh, it'll be at 10 o'clock, and it'll be one class only, and it will be in the sanctuary. So uh, everybody's welcome to come. It's not just for, for that class that's in the sanctuary. Everybody wants to come to Sunday school. Well, you're welcome to come at 10 o'clock and it'll be taught in the sanctuary because the church is already sanitized, it's already clean for the morning service, so there, there's no reason we can't do Sunday school following the same protocol. We're still not going to do Sunday afternoon service just yet because it takes so long to clean and sanitize the church between the services, so we're not doing Sunday evening yet. But Sunday school that morning, and then... Next Wednesday night, that'll be the 24th, uh, next Wednesday night <clears throat> is when we're going to do the Bible study back, back in the sanctuary. So prayerfully, that'll, that'll take care of that. All right. Well, I, I, hope you're, I hope you're ready to study Revelation. Me and Randall's got the coffee going. I'm going to miss this next week in that sanctuary. I might just have to take a coffee break, come out here and get some coffee and go back in give an intermission yeah you can see that happening can't you yeah all right tonight we're, we're this is week number 38 and we're still in chapter 6 we're still talking about the scrolls being open and tonight we're going to look at verses 9 through 11 which is the fifth seal and we're going to take just this one seal tonight because there's there's a lot of teaching in that and we're, we're just going to try to to get the to get the gist of it so we understand about it without going into great theological details or anything. We're, we're just going to try to get the, get the main impact of what we need to see that's going on with these seals. And that's why we're going to take number five tonight by itself rather than trying to do two at the time. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter six, you're probably already there. And if you get your notebook ready and I've got some scripture references that I'll be sharing with you. I've already got them written down, so I don't have to take the time to turn to them. But I'll give them to you, and you can go back, and you, you make a note of them, and you can go back and read them, and put them into your notes as well. All right, let's, let's, start, let's start by, by reading, <clears throat> reading the scripture here in chapter 6. As always, 
I'm going to start at verse number 1 in chapter 6. Now, we're going to look at verses 9 through 11, but I'm going to, I'm going to read from verse 1 all the way down through verse 11, and then we'll go back and we'll look at those verses in our study. All right, chapter 6 and verse 1. John said, Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it had a bow. And the crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Now when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. And another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth. And that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. Verse 5. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Now when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades, or Hell, followed with him. And the power was given to him over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. Now tonight, verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? In verse 11, Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them, that they should rest a little while, a little while longer, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. Oh, we're looking at seal number five. If your Bible has headings in it, it might say the fifth seal is the cry of the martyrs. Well, that's what we're going to that's what we're going to look at. I want you to pray for me. Father, we thank you tonight for another opportunity to to once again use this format to bring this word to those who are watching. Lord, we're looking forward to next week that we might be together in the sanctuary so that we can study this again in a group setting. But Lord, we know you're able to use this, so we trust you, God, that all that we do here will, will glorify you. It will unify the, the believers and it will edify them. That's our goal. So I pray right now, Holy Spirit, just as you, you unveiled this to John and, and you unveiled it to Christians before us in the first century and centuries past, that you unveil it unto us, Holy Spirit. We might see that which you want us to see that we might be better disciples, be better evangelists, and help you in building your church here on earth. And we'll give you the thanks, and we'll give you the praise, and we'll give you the glory as you guide us into all truth. In your name, Jesus, we say it by faith. Amen and amen. All right. <clears throat> Excited about this. I love this book of Revelation. Good stuff. All right, let's talk about let's talk about the seal number five. Now, without going into a whole lot of review, which is probably what I will do next week in the in the sanctuary, we'll try to review and catch up on everything as we as we begin our sessions back in there. But tonight, without doing a, a whole lot of review, I'm just going just going to try to cover this the fifth seal 
in relation to the other seals. And as you've noticed in, in reading that, there's a, there's a difference in this seal and, and in the other ones in, in, how it, in how it was revealed unto John and the things that are presented in it. Now, John sees something different as compared to those horses and the turmoil that, that had come upon, that had been unleashed on the earth and in the other seals. And at this point, we know, we know by what he has told us, that one-fourth of the earth's population has died. One-fourth of the population of the earth. They died by way of hunger. They, they died by way of beast of the earth. And as he said, they, they died naturally. Some of them were killed by battle, you know, by the sword, just by warring among themselves. So after, after that was taking place, which was three and a half years into the tribulation, that that will happen, now this fifth seal is being opened, and we see that that some of those, some of those who who died on the earth during this three and a half year thing, some of those who, who died with the opening of, of seal number four, some of them are in heaven. Some of them are in heaven. Some of some of them are in Hades, because Hades, hell was following death. We talked about that. And, and the unbelievers and those who reject Christ, that's where they end up. And some of them ended up there, but glory to God, some of them were in heaven. <laughs> you know, John, John saw these souls there, and, and they're not there waiting to be judged. The souls that he saw are there in heaven with him. Don't, for, don't forget now, don't, don't lose track. It's easy, it's easy to lose track of where we come from when you look at where we're going. But don't lose track in this book now. Under, understand that, that the church was called up to heaven. We, we believe that. We, we believe in chapter 4 at the beginning is, is what we call the rapture of the church. We, we believe that the church is, we're premillennialists, we pre-tribulationalists as Pentecostals. We, we believe that the church is taken out for the wrath. So at chapter 4, the beginning, we, we believe the church will be in heaven for the opening of these seals and the execution of the wrath of God <clears throat> throughout what's called the Great Tribulation, those seven years. So don't lose sight of the fact that John is still in heaven. He's still in the midst of the throne. The 24 elders are still there. The four living creatures are still there. That multitude of angels that was worshiping, remember them? The, you know, the, that he could not count how many of them they were that we read that were that were worshiping, they're all still, they're all still there in heaven. That multitude's there. And the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, uh, a lamb as it was slain, the one who's holding the scroll and opening it, he's there in the presence too. So, so don't don't forget that. Don't think that this is this is a new uh, somehow a new event that's taking place. All this is happening in front of John, right there in heaven. So now we're, we're going to break this fifth seal down and, and talk about it just, just briefly, like I said, with, without trying to, to do any kind of um, big, big, deep analyzation or theological study on that. All right, let's start with verse 9. Verse 9. Now, John said, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held. Now, we know what their testimony is, don't we? We know that the testimony has to be, has to be that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. We read that in the letters to the seven churches, didn't we? We read that he is the one who was dead and now he's alive. He is the Messiah. He's the living Savior. And the testimony that, that people have to that is what leads us to salvation and what leads us into the kingdom is knowing that he's alive and believing that and accepting that is, is how we're born again. So here's something I want you to notice in, in, the, way it, in the way it turns out. First of all, no, nobody called out to John to come and see this time. Did you catch that? I, I know you probably did. In the other seals, First creature said, come and see. The second creature said, come and see. The third creature said, come and see. The fourth creature said, come and see. That took care of the four creatures. Now we get to the fifth seal. There ain't no more creatures left. There's only four living creatures. But we get to the fifth seal, 
And nobody says come and see. It just, it just unveils right before him. He sees this. Now, as I've said before, always remember that that which John is seeing is shown to him for the very purpose of being able to put it down on the parchment for us. That's the description. Now, Jesus could have easily read what we just read off of the scroll. He could have easily just said, this is what's taking place on the earth, John. And he could have read that. But he gave John that vision that John might be able to, to interpret that and to put it on the parchment as he sees it rather than as he actually hears it being read. He sees it playing out right before his eyes. And that's what he's, that's what he's writing down here. So now here's what he sees. He sees souls under the altar. <laughs> he, he sees the elders. He sees the living creatures. He sees a multitude of the angels. He sees the one who sits on the throne. Uh, there's one still on the throne. Remember him? The one that handed the seal over to the Lamb. And then he sees the Lamb who is holding the scroll, who is peeling the seals back. He, he still sees all that. But, it's, but, but he says he sees the souls that are under the altar. Let, let me say this. Let me put a plug in here for altars. You know, I, I know that in our day and time, in the contemporary church, a lot of times, the altar is, is becoming less important. And, I, and I'm talking about the, the furniture. I'm talking about the furniture. Now, don't get me wrong here. I, I realize there, there are spiritual altars that people have. But, but the altar has always had, held a special place in the kingdom of God and in his plan. And, and it was for the very fact that that's where he, what he had put as, if you want to say, a barrier, a gateway, or, or a place that, that we here on earth are able to come to that we might meet with him. Now listen, we can meet him anywhere. We, we can have a spiritual altar wherever we might be and have audience with God. But, but the altar has always held, held a special purpose. Now this altar that John is talking about, don't, don't picture in your mind the, the big altar that they, that they did the burnt offerings on. That thing was huge. That they walked the steps up on that thing and they did the sacrifices. And, and in your mind, you may get a picture of that, of that giant altar and people are standing under that. Well, that's, that's the vision that John is incurring, but that's not, that's not the implication or the application to what John wants us to understand. Here's how I know that. Remember what's, what's been going on, what will go on, the first three years of the tribulation. Remember? Remember the Jews are going to be doing their sacrifices? They're going to start the temple sacrifices back? When they do that, guys, they're going to go whole hog, for, for lack of better terminology. They, they're going to have the altar back in place. It's going to be set up to the template that Moses had gave them in the book of Exodus. It's going to be set up into that pattern, and they're going to follow those same procedures. So the big altar will be there. The altar of sacrifice will be there. But lo and behold, when, when Antichrist breaks that covenant, when he breaks the deal that, that he has with the Jews, that they might be able to carry out this worship up, up on the earth, and we said before, we know it's not going. Everybody's not going to be in agreement with that. But he doesn't really care because he's the one in charge, and he said this is what we're going to do. And the Jews are doing that. But when he breaks that covenant with the Jews, when that when that begins to fall apart, then, then guess what's going to happen? The sacrifices are going to stop. They're going to stop. The altar is still in place. Everything is in place, but it's, but it's no longer going to be used for the purpose that it was used for. See, it, it was on that altar that the animals are sacrificed for, for the sins, for the fellowship offerings. It, it's, it's the fact that God has always required death of the innocent for sin. Now listen, the, the, the sinner's going to die and pay for his own sin if he, if he fails to accept the death of the innocent for his sin. And in our case today, the death of the innocent was the death of Jesus Christ. 
He's the sacrificial lamb. He's the ultimate lamb who paid the ultimate price for our sins. He was innocent of sin, but he died for sin. But it was our sin, not his. So God, God has set that in place from the beginning. And if we don't accept that, then the sinner is going to have to have to pay the wages of his own sin. And Paul told the Roman church that the wages of sin is death. They are. So, so the sinner can do one of two things. You can either you can either repent and ask God to forgive you for your sin and get the spiritual rebirth from Christ and ask the Holy Spirit to come into your heart and, and, and to guide you and direct you and to keep you so that he's in you and you're in him so that when you die or the rapture takes place, you'll be with him forever. Or you can reject that and live your life any, any way you want to and just hope for the best. But listen, that sin's going to be paid for. So when, when someone tells you, oh, I don't believe a loving God will send anybody to hell, you can say, I agree with you. He's not going to send anybody to hell, but he's not going to stand in the way of those who want to go. If, if they want to reject Christ and they want to pay for their own sin, he's going to let that happen. He's going to let that happen. Because hell was riding right behind death on that horse. How did I get started on that? Anyway, here we are. <clears throat> The altar of sacrifice would symbolize the spiritual reconciliation with God. And now we know that our body, the body has been cursed, right? We know that from the Garden of Eden. And cursed is he who hangs on a tree, even, the writer wrote. But yet the body has been cursed due to the sin in the garden. But our souls continue to live. That's proof of that. If you need proof of that, here it is in the book of Revelation. John says, I saw. Somebody didn't just tell him those souls were under the altar. He saw them. He saw them, just like he saw those angels. And for he, for he to see that, for him to see that, we understand that these souls were saved by the same blood, listen to me, that we are saved by. Okay? Now, look at you have to look at that carefully because... When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain. Not, not that they just died naturally. Being slain means they were murdered. They were killed for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Well, what is the word of God? Jesus. Jesus is the word of God. John said he is the word. He, he's the word of God. So the testimony they held was when God has said in his word, listen, Jesus is the Messiah. Three and a half years into that thing, they were doing the sacrifices and it all blows up. And, and there are those who are going to say, guess what? We were wrong. We're not really reconciled to God any longer through the sacrifices. That's not how we do it. The only way to be reconciled to God is through Jesus Christ. Therefore, we're going to accept him. We're going to believe in him. We're going to be born again. And that's how we're going to be saved. Well, who, who, was, the ones, who was the ones that were anti-Christ when Christ was here on earth? The Jews. And I say the Jews, not all of them. The Pharisees. The Pharisaical system. Because they, they taught that Christ was a, was a heretic. That no man could take away sin. It's only by the grace of God. He's the one that forgives sin. Well, that's true. But he gave the sacrifices, as he said unto Abraham. Abraham believed God. It was accounted to him as righteousness. Those who sacrificed the animals and did that, knowing that's what God had, had asked them to do in order that they might be atoned that the, for forgiveness, that's what they did. That worked at that time. But listen, Jesus put all that Put all that away. It's a new covenant. Well, it's a new way to enforce the covenant that God has had with his people. Up until that point, it was the death of bulls and goats and lambs. But now it was the death of Jesus that reconciles everybody to God. I want to be reconciled to him. And those in the three and a half years who say, well, we blew it because this didn't reconcile us to God because now his wrath has fallen on us then at that point, they're going to be killed for their testimony. That, that's interesting. That's interesting. But the only way they're saved is the same way that you and I are saved today, 
and it was by the shed blood of Jesus. We we read that. We just read that in a, in a few chapters back when they when they were talking about the worship right here. He said it was it was in your own blood. If you look at chapter or chapter five and verse nine, you're worthy to take the soul, open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. So that's how that's how they were, were redeemed the same way that we were. Now here's how here's how we can put that into perspective. Hebrews chapter nine, Hebrews chapter nine, and verses eleven through fifteen. Make a note of these. Make a note of these scriptures. Go back and read them. Hebrews chapter nine, eleven through fifteen. Here's what it says. But Christ, listen carefully. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is, it's not of this creation. The tabernacle on earth was made by human hands. <laughs> not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. That's how you and I have eternal life. He obtained it for us. For, listen, listen, this is a good argument. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, all right, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, huh? unblemished, no sin, how much more can he cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Boy, that's interesting. And for this reason, here we go, for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. That, that qualifies my statement when I say they, they, they ended up under that altar by the same blood that you and I ended up under that altar by. It was not the blood of the bulls and goats that were sacrificed in the first three and a half years of that tribulation. <laughs> Wrong answer. It was the blood of Jesus. And they were killed because of the testimony that they held for the blood of Christ. Now, we're, we see here in just a few minutes... They're not the only ones that's going to be killed for the testimony of Jesus Christ. All right? Now, these souls are called martyrs because John tells us that they were slain. And that means they were intentionally killed. They didn't die by accident. They were intentionally killed for a, for a reason. And that reason was because they had, they had at some point confessed that Christ was the only way to be saved and not the sacrifices. And the reason for that is they believe the word of God and testify to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. And, and that's what got them killed. That's why they were slain. And that's how they ended up where they were. Now realize the sacrificial system is going to be in full swing. It's going to be in full swing. And when it stopped, it's going to be a bad time. It, it's not going to be... You, you know, you think that first three and a half years when the sacrifices began and, and the Bible says that, that it's, there's going to be a time of peace. Listen, that time of peace ain't going to mean that everybody there is going to be getting along all right. It's going to mean they're just not going to be fighting. They, they're not going to be doing what we're seeing going on today. But on the inside, on the inside, they're still not going to be going along with that. And when that system falls apart, that's when everybody's going to flare up and they're going to get mad and they're going to say, wait a minute. This is a bunch of hoopla. It didn't work. And that's when war is going to break out against who? Against those that said, this is what we're going to do. And then war will break out and, and they'll try to do it their way. So it is probable that these souls 
uh, came to the conclusion that, that that sacrifice wouldn't save them. That's probable. And it is probable that they called out to God and confessed Christ, and then they were slain because of that allegiance to him. Now, you're a Bible scholar. You Bible scholars out there, you're probably going to say, well, how do they know that's what they're supposed to do? I mean, the church is gone, so who's, listen, if they're going to start the sacrificial system back according to the law that Moses gave them, they know the law of Moses. Let me tell you what's written in the Psalms. They know the Old Testament. Psalms 116 and verse 4. Listen to what this psalm tells them to do. Then David said, I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. That's all they had to do. That's what they had to do. They knew that's what they would have to do. That's all they would have had to do in order to, to have God accept them just as he accepted that thief on the cross when he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Listen, all that goes with our attitude towards who we are, sinners, and who he is, the Savior. And once we get that lined up right and understand that, then God is able to save us and give us that rebirth once we, once we call upon him to do it. Paul told the same thing to the church in Rome. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not might be, ought to be, or want to be. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I'm talking about sincerely wanting to be saved. I'm not just saying, save me, Lord, and go on about your business and not bring God into it. Now, it's not just for us. When, when Paul, told, Paul told that to the Romans and he wrote that, it wasn't just for them, and it's not just for us. It's for these people who are going to be in the tribulation. This same scripture that says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, that scripture will stand true as long as there are sinners on the earth. <laughs> as long as there's people on the earth who are sinners and need to be saved, this scripture will stand true for them. Whether it's now, whether it's in the tribulation, whether it's in the millennial, we'll talk about that as well. It's not just for us. It's for those who come after us. And he doesn't say when we have to do it. He says we have to do it. But we know it's got to be while we're, while we're alive, while we're in this body. We know that. It is very likely, listen, it's very likely that the Antichrist will begin to kill those who turn to the real Christ even before he implements the mark later on. We're going to see that happening. I'm going to sum all that up for you when we get when we get to the mark of the beast, of why the mark of the beast, um, I'm going to tell you why the beast has to have a mark, or you have to have a mark, why he requires that. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to explain that to you when we get there. But this indicates to me, listen, we haven't got to that far yet, but this indicates to me that there are those who are going to be killed even before that when they deny the sacrifices is what saved them and they look to Jesus to save them, that's the point that they will be killed even at that time. Why? Because this guy is in power, and his very, his very title is Antichrist. What's his name? I don't know. 666. Figure it out. But he is Antichrist. That's his title. Antichrist. So if you're pro-Christ, he's not going to be on your side. He's Antichrist. So the moment they say, we're trusting Jesus, that's it. Well, you got a mark or not. That's what happened in this first three and a half years. Let's go to verse 10. Now, after he saw, after he saw them souls, here's what they're doing. Verse 10. And they cried out with a loud voice. Here's what they were saying. How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Don't think for one minute that this is a call for revenge. All right? Let me read that to you again. This is a question. This is a question. Listen. They cried, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? 
on the earth? That's a question. That, that's not something, it's not like they're going to be held on that altar as prisoners until he judges those on the earth and then it's going to be paid for. Listen, honey, their sins were paid for when Christ died on the cross just like ours was. Okay? What, they, what they're wanting to understand is when is this complete judgment going to come up on the earth? There's no, no doubt in my mind there's Jews in this crowd. No doubt in my mind. And you say, well, where do they get that question from? Why would they ask that? Well, I'm glad you asked me that. Because the Bible tells us where they got that question from. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 43. Here's what it says. Rejoice, O Gentiles. How about that? That's us. With his people. There's both groups. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. What are we rejoicing for? For he will, Father Murphy, if you're watching, he will avenge the blood of his servants and render vengeance to his adversaries. He will provide atonement for his land and his people. Huh? He said in Deuteronomy, I'm going to avenge it. I'm going to bring vengeance upon my adversaries. They knew that. They knew that. They learned right quick who the adversaries were. And their question is, how long is it going to be until you do that? How much time is going to pass until you do that? Well, he tells them. He, he tells them in a sense. He doesn't give them, he doesn't give them the, the, the hours and the minutes and the days that he tells them. He answers it for them right here in our next verse. He tells them when he's going to do it because her question is, is this all there is? I mean, we, we've, we've been killed but because of believing, and, and now they're still on the earth. Uh, I mean, you said you was going to avenge it, so when's that going to happen? Isn't that, isn't that what we ask today? Why, well, yeah, you know we do. We're the same way. How many, of you, how many of you have said this in the past week? How many of you have actually said this? Maybe somebody else. Maybe you just saw it. How long, oh Lord, are you going to let this go on? How long are you going to let all this mess that's in the world, how long are you going to let this go on? I preached on that Sunday morning, if, if you want to go back to YouTube and pull up the sermon. You know why? Because Peter said he's not slack concerning the promise that he's going to come. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. The only reason that he's allowing things to happen as they are now, there are still people that need to be saved. You might be one of them. There are still people who need to be saved. There are people in my family who need to be saved. There are people in your family who need to be saved. There are people in the community, in the state, in the nation, in the government, in the world who need to be saved. He wants them to be saved. But listen, there's a cutoff point coming. At some point, it's going to happen. But the reason it hasn't happened is the same reason he answers these guys in verse 11 here. It follows the same plan. Listen, God, God is not out just to destroy the wicked and send them into hell. That you know, He said, I have no pleasure in doing that. You can find that in the Old Testament. I have no pleasure in destroying the wicked. That's why he sent his son. He wants people to be saved. He, he wants them to be saved. And that's what his goal is. So this is not a cry of vengeance. This is just a question. And he answers that for them in verse 11. Look what he says. Then a white robe was given to each of them. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer. <laughs> I think that's what he's saying to us, church. Calm down. Rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants, John heard him tell them that. He said, rest a little while longer until the number of your fellow servants and your brethren, their brethren, who would be killed as they were, it's completed. It's finished. 
Jesus tells these guys, there's more, there's more to come. Excuse me. There's more to come. There's more to come. There was going to be some more who are going to be killed just like you were. And I'm not going to bring the vengeance on them. I'm going to wait until they come just as you have come. And then when I've got all you guys together, then I'll bring vengeance on the adversaries. That's how it's going to play out. We're going to see that in this book. Now here's something to understand about that. When you're reading through this, it's easy to it's easy to think, well, these are the souls under the altar, and these are listen, understand these souls died after the rapture. Make a note of that. They died after the rapture. See, we said in chapter four, we believe the church is in heaven. John was in heaven, and then he saw these souls come into view while he was already there. He saw these horses released. He saw all this death come up on the earth. And then all of a sudden, he sees out of all that death that happened on the earth, he sees souls end up in heaven under the altar. And, and that, just simply, that just simply means they, they were there because of the sacrifice of the blood, the blood sacrifice. That's what happened on the altar. But it was the blood of Jesus that saved them. But John saw that. These guys, these guys were, were saved after the rapture. See? And, and here's what happens in the rapture. You know what happens in the rapture? You, you hear it read at every funeral for a Christian, don't you? First Corinthians, we read it all the time. And, and the trump of the Lord shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And, and those of us who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, and so we shall ever be with the Lord. Thessalonians, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed. Comfort one another with these words, he said. That's the rapture. That's the rapture. These guys didn't go up in the rapture. We did. Those guys are going to go up after the rapture. So guess what? Their bodies haven't been resurrected yet. He said, I seen the souls. I saw the souls. And robes were given to those souls. Now, it, it, it's a stretch for me, and I've read some, some of the theologians who, who had said, there is a temporary body that these guys had that the robe was hung up on. Listen, I, I'm not one to argue things, but I'm, I'm just a plain, common sense, old, I haven't hoped for it. A spirit, the soul is a spirit, a spirit doesn't have a body. And, it, and if, he, if he gives it, why would he give us a temporary body and change it? Uh, I mean, the body we're in is, is corruptible. The body they were in was corruptible. Their body was killed. There's no sense in giving them another body that you're going to do away with. That just don't make sense. That doesn't follow what the Bible says. No, there, there wasn't a glorified body there yet. They were given a robe. Why were they given a robe? Because they're saved. And the robe of righteousness indicates to John that these guys are saved. So just as we are awaiting our resurrection, which, which will come at the rapture, that's when our resurrection is going to come because we're on this side of the tribulation right now. And we die now. We're going to be raised at the rapture. And if we're not dead, we're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. But this is after the rapture. And those guys... Those guys missed the rapture, but they're going to be resurrected. We're going to read about that. We're going to find out there's two more resurrections. Uh, oh, that's interesting. We're, we're going to get to that later on. But they have not yet received their glorified body. They're, they're there. They're waiting. So they simply say, how long is it going to be before we're going to be completed here? When you bring the vengeance and everything, and he said, just, just rest, guys. Just, just relax. Rest a little while. I've got this plan. It's going to unfold. Don't get excited. Just, just, just rest for a while. He's, he gave them the robe. Say, look, you're okay. This is your robe of righteousness. Nothing's going to happen to you. You're here, so just relax. It's, it's going to be all right for you. Now, minding your souls... We're robed with the Holy Spirit upon our rebirth. 
why why do you think why do you think we have to have that spiritual rebirth in our hearts so that Christ robes us with his righteousness? Because Isaiah said we don't have anything we can wear that makes us righteous. He said our righteousness is like filthy rags. Yeah. So we don't have anything that we can wear that makes us righteous with God, but the Holy Spirit makes us righteous with God. When we become born again, we are clothed, we are robed with the Holy Spirit until we receive our glorified body. All right? That's pretty simple. That's how, that's how it is. The righteousness of Christ is imputed to us until the moment we die or the moment we're changed and become like him at the rapture. Because Paul said that's, what ha that's what's going to happen you know, we're going to see him as he is and we're going to become like him in the glorified body. Now, we're not going to be equal to him. Don't you ever think that. God help you. Don't ever think that. But we're going to have a glorified body just as his body was glorified. And it was pretty cool. I mean, he could walk through walls and still eat fish. You know? So it's, it's, it's coming for us. It's coming. And, and it will be at, at the rapture because we're on this side of the tribulation. We're not in the tribulation yet. No, we're not. Uh, I said, I know if you were in one of the third world countries somewhere and they're killing Christians and cutting their heads off, you probably think you're in the tribulation, but you're not. It's not there yet. It's not there yet, but it's on the way. But that's why it's important you've got to accept Christ now. You've got to do it now. See, those who die in Christ are present with the Lord awaiting their glorified body. Well, what about the brother we just buried yesterday? Well, he was a born-again Christian. He's with the Lord right now at this moment. I'm, I'm here teaching this stuff on the earth. He's there in paradise with the Lord. He's waiting on his glorified body, which will take place at the rapture. For the dead in Christ shall rise first, and all of us are going to be changed. So, yeah, he's got the white frame and all. I mean, he's there in the road. Well, how do you know it? Well... John told us that in chapter 3. In chapter 3, he saw all that. It was in the churches. Listen, here's what Jesus said to one of the churches. And we talked about those churches. It weren't just for a particular church in a particular age. It's for all churches in all ages. Revelation 3, 4, and 5. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, and they are worthy. There'll be people in the church saying, how about that? He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I'll confess his name before my Father, Jesus said, and his angels. Now here's the kicker. <clears throat> No one actually knows exactly how this is, or, or how this looks, or how it plays out. Nobody can really answer that for you. Now, you, you take everything in the scripture, you put it together, you, you imagine, you, you try to get an idea. Listen, I have no idea how, how this body's going to be changed. I have no idea. All, all I know is that, that Paul wrote in the Thessalonians, he said, look, if you look, if you look, well, let's use an example, corn. He said, look at the grain. If you take a kernel of corn and you plant that thing in the ground and you look at that big, that, that big cob that comes out of that thing <laughs> and, and you see that little, that little kernel and you see all this big head of corn that comes out of that, it, it doesn't always look like what was planted. He said, that which is planted will grow into something that, that will look totally different than that which grows into the ground. So, so nobody can really tell you exactly how all that's going to be, but, but that's all right. You know, all that really matters is a fact, is that we will be there. I, I don't care how I look in heaven. I, I don't care what kind of body it, it, it is. I, 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 I'm not worried about the glorified body. I just want to be there. I just want to be there. And, and I know that by him living in my heart, he is in me. I am in him. The rest of it's up to him. <laughs> I'm going to be with him forever and ever. And how I'm going to look, I ain't worried about it. I don't worry about how I look here. I certainly wouldn't, 
worry about it there. We know that. So nobody actually knows it. But the main thing is we got to make sure that our souls, our souls are ready for that, for that glorified body. Now, there's another resurrection coming. And we're, we'll talk about that when we get into chapter 20 of the book. Chapter 20 of Revelation, we're going to talk about another resurrection. There's going to be other resurrections. But apparently the answer that Jesus gives to these souls here in, in verse 11, uh, apparently he, he, is, he is somewhat hinting at that. He is referring to that, that you and I will pick up in verse 20, or in chapter 20, I'm sorry, when we get there. And we'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, the Lord should come before we do, then we don't have to worry about it. He'll, he'll straighten it out for us. Now, you got to remember, there are three and a half more years yet to come. Three and a half more years yet to come. Three and a half years into that thing, it all blowed up. There's going to be it's going to be three and a half years left after that, and and that's what we're going to be looking at as we start as we go on all the way up to chapter 18 and partially into chapter 19. So although they don't realize it yet, he assures, he assures them that he is going to stay true to his word that, because that's what the tribulation is going to be about. He, he is going to, he's going to avenge uh, those whom he said he would avenge. That, 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 makes him, that makes him a just God. So for those who would say, well, I can't see that a loving God would send anybody to hell, then he's not a loving God. He's not a loving God if he doesn't judge fairly. If, if, he, if he says that I sent my son to die on the cross for your sin, and you must accept that in order to be reconciled unto me, but yet on the other side of his mouth he says, but it don't matter if you do or not, I love you anyway, that's blasphemy, guys. That's blasphemy. No, it's not that. God, God, loves, God loves all of us, but he hates sin. He hates sin. And that's why he sent his son to pay the price for it. And those who reject him, those who, who have rejected him, and those who will reject him, they're going to pay the price for doing that. And that's what makes him a just God. That's what makes him a loving God. I don't have to reject him. I have a human choice to accept him. He didn't predestine me to heaven or hell. He gave me the choice that he did predestine Christ in order that he might die on the cross for my sins. And because he was predestined to die on the cross, I can be predestined to go to heaven by believing in him and through him. That's what we have got to do. Well, I hope to see you in the sanctuary next week. I'm looking forward to, to, to being able to look you in the eye. I want to see the look on your faces when I, when I say these things. And, and I can tell whether it's sinking in or whether you cock your eyebrows or whether you rrr, I can tell by looking how it hits you. And that's what I want to know. And then we can discuss it with one another. So hopefully you can join us next week, 7 o'clock, here in the sanctuary. We'll follow the same procedures as we've been following with the social distancing. We, we, we still have, we, we got the sanitizer all over the church. We still have the masks that are available. Uh, if you want to wear a mask, you are more than welcome to wear a mask. And we, we'll even give you one if you want one. So that, that'll be available to you. We'll be here in the church at, at uh, Lord willing. Uh, maybe I should say, and the creeks don't rise. We'd probably say that, Kevin we, Ren. Uh, Lord willing, 7 o'clock next week. Let's have a closing prayer. Next week, we're going to look at, at verses 12 through 17. And that'll be the sixth seal. Okay, let's pray. Oh, Lord, I thank you tonight. I thank you for your word. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the Holy Spirit. I thank you for my life. I thank you for my redemption. I thank you for my salvation. I thank you for this word that you have given us. And, and as, as the late Dr. Billy Graham, your servant, as he said, <laughs> I've read the end of the book and we win. I have too, and I agree with him. And I thank you for that. So I pray now, Lord, as, as these lessons have went forth just one-on-one -on -one over Facebook, and we'll continue to do that by your help. We'll continue to broadcast these even when we're back in the sanctuary so that those who can attend 
that father or, or don't attend that they'll still be able to pull them up and, and to be with us in class and we thank you for that but I ask your blessing upon this word I pray God that that I, I know I know we cover a whole lot and I know the Holy Spirit's got so much more that he wants to teach us but father help us to to be patient and to learn as we go and to let you let you teach us and as as we know it, it's not it's not what we think but it's what your word says and how we think determines on how much we know your word so I pray father that you just you just bless those who have been watching help them be with them guide them direct them help them in their witness help them in all that they do as they build your kingdom with your help we'll give you all the thanks and the praise and the glory because it's all because of you Jesus thank you in your name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I hope to see you next week here in the church.